Good evening. 25 years ago, Stephen Hawking invited me to his office uh, here on Silver Street to discuss the Big Bang. That was his idea of uh, a job interview. Uh, so I pushed open the door to his office, I enter, and there he was, the great man, sitting quietly behind his desk, smiling gently, complete silence. There was a screensaver scrolling across the screen, and it said, to boldly go where Star Trek fears to tread. So Stephen had already lost his voice by then, um, but he had a computer voice. And this is what he said. So, good luck with your next job interview. In fact, this first conversation was a revelation for me. Um, here was a rare physicist guided in his research by these big questions that humans have always asked. Why is the universe fit for life? What should we make of this? Uh, so I think Stephen fundamentally was a humanist. Even though he was out studying black holes and the Big Bang, I think fundamentally he did so because he believed we'd better understand ourselves. And so um, that first conversation evolved into an intense collaboration, which really only st uh, ended with his, with his passing uh, 20 years later. And even though these big questions were, all, were often in the background in our technical research, they were never absent. And once in a while, they would come to the forefront. And that was very interesting, because in physics and in science, when the big questions come to the forefront, you know you're onto something. You know you're learning something, not just about nature, but about science itself. And so I want to give you a teaser tonight of um, what it is that we uh, found out. So in a sense, um, the, the fact that the universe is habitable, the fact that the universe is fit for life, is all around us. These beautiful images of the James Webb te Space Telescope, these cosmic cliffs, these clouds of gas, well, that's where new stars and planets form. That's where you also find the atoms and the organic molecules that can later be the building blocks of life. But of course, the universe wasn't born with those clouds of gas, with those cosmic cliffs, they're the result of 13 billion years of evolution. So if we want to understand the deeper origin of the fitness for life of the universe, we'd have to look back in time to the Big Bang. And that's where it becomes puzzling. Why the hell did the Big Bang get it right? So that billions of years later, the conditions for life would be there um, for layers of complexity to emerge. Well, in the old days, um, people pointed to a designer. Uh, the universe was destined to be like this, Ar Aristotle's final cause. Today, we, talk, we point to the laws of nature. It turns out that the laws of nature have all sorts of properties that make life possible the composition of the universe with lots of dark matter makes it possible for galaxies and stars to form. The delicate balance between the particle forces makes it possible for atoms to be there. And then we have such basic things as three dimensions of space and one clear arrow of time without which nothing like we know would be possible. So there's this barcode the laws of nature, you can think of them as a barcode underlying rules, underlying the universe, how it runs. And that barcode was, we think, imprinted on the universe at its birth. So who ordered this? That was the kind of question that would remain, that, that was on top of Stephen's agenda in our first encounter. And that would really remain with us 
for all these years. So where do the laws of nature come from? In fact, the idea that there is such a thing as a law of nature has a long history. It goes back to the ancient Greeks. People trace it to Anaximander, a philosopher in what's today Turkey, who, came, who by analogy with laws of society, reasoned that, well, maybe there are also laws of nature. And so he's often portrayed as the father of physics. Physis, eh, the study of nature. Much, much later, another Cambridge hero, eh, Isaac Newton, discovered the mathematical roots underlying the laws of nature. And since then, the idea was born that, well, perhaps these are eternal truths. Perhaps these are some sort of foundation on which everything else is built. And to some extent, this was borne out by experience. From the stunning power of the laws of nature to predict things we don't expect. One of the most famous moments in 19th century science came when a Frenchman, Le Verrier, was calculating with Newton's laws. Uh, and on the basis of his calculations, he predicted that there should be another planet in our solar system. And sure enough, astronomers found Neptune. So whatever you guys think of the French, they did discover another planet just by calculating, right? And in fact, this, this idea, this idea that the laws of nature or that there should be an ultimate law of nature that dictates how the universe should be was an idea famously held by Einstein as well. Einstein searched famously for the ultimate law, what became known as the theory of everything. But you see, he's looking a little puzzled there. Um, and indeed, things were not going according to plan. Pressure came, in fact, from Belgium, of all places. Um, so here we have uh, Einstein's equation. Um, Einstein wrote down this beautiful theory. It's his theory of general relativity. It's a theory about, uh, it's a dialogue between uh, matter on the one hand and space and time on the other hand. And that equal, equal sign is where the magic happens. Together, that dialogue, in fact, that is generates what we know and love as gravity. So it's a beautiful formula, relating space, time, matter, and gravity. But um, a Belgian astronomer decided to apply Einstein's equation to the entire universe, to all of space. And he discovered, Georges Lemaitre discovered, that the universe, that space must be expanding, and so that galaxies must be moving away from one another. And then, Lemaitre did something clever. He turned back time. <laughs> he ran the history of the universe backwards in time, using Einstein's equation. And of course, if the universe expands in one, direc in one direction, it's going to shrink when you go back in time. And Lemaitre discovered that a finite time in the past, space and time destroy themselves. It's a very curious observation, Einstein's equation that you see there has the very strange property that it predicts its own demise in the Big Bang uh, billions of years ago. So the Big Bang is not just an explosion, it is really the origin of time itself. So what do you do when you discover the Big Bang? Well, Lemaitre was also a priest, so he couldn't tell his wife. So he wrote a poem about it, about that instant, that instant, that day, which he called it the day without yesterday. And so the last paragraph there, this is the first instant, the now which has no yesterday, because yesterday there was no space. And in fact, Lemaitre talked taught about the Big Bang as a kind of, he, he spoke about a of it as a primeval atom, a kind of very abstract state out of which he imagined space and time and matter uh, would emerge. But back to this design question, 
back to this strange biophilic character of our universe at the level of the laws of physics. Maybe the Big Bang isn't so bad. Because imagine there comes a unique biophilic universe out of the Big Bang that in a sense, even though we don't understand it, we'd be home. Well, in fact, Lemaitre calculated it. And as you can see, the Big Bang is in the left corner there, T equals zero, he writes. Uh, there's a whole zoo of universes coming out of the Big Bang. Uh, each curve represents a possible history of the universe. Time runs on the horizontal axis, and on the vertical axis you have something like the size of the universe. You see some universes expand and then contract, and others keep on expanding. So there's many, many possible universes coming out of this um, possible within, within Einstein's theory. And in fact, the question that Stephen posed during our first conversation, why is the universe the way it is, it is already there. Because all these universes that you see here, all but one of them are lifeless. The universes that recontract don't have enough time to form life, and the universes that expand too fast, they don't form galaxies. There's only one curve, which Lemaitre called a hesitating universe, in which eventually the conditions for life arise. And that's the one curve going horizontally um, to the edge of the office. Yeah, this is millimeter paper on which you used to solve differential equations before there were computers, right? In fact, Lemaitre didn't stop. There's a second page, I didn't bring it, uh, there's a second page in the archives of Lemaitre where he continues with this one universe and see whether it eventually uh, also begins to expand. Now you might wonder, well, what did Einstein think of all this? Well, Lemaitre talked about, that, talked about it with Einstein. Here you see them talking over the origin of the universe, these two chaps. Um, but uh, Einstein wouldn't have it. He thought that Lemaitre was trying to sneak in Christian dogma into science, and that was not to his likings. It took a remarkable series, early 1931, it took a remarkable series of letters from Leuven in Belgium to Cambridge, from Cambridge to Leiden, from London to Leuven, from Leiden to Leuven, and from Leuven to London, to spread the gospel of the discovery of the expansion of the universe. The, the last letter essentially concludes this whole conversation among uh, Eddington and the Sitter and, and Lemaitre that, look, uh, Dr. Lemaitre, you should translate your paper in English and then um, we, we understand what you mean. And so that's what happened. Uh, okay, so but of course, as you know, it took many more decades for this whole idea of a Big Bang to, to become falsified, to, to, to have observational support. It's only in the 60s, really, with the discovery of the cosmic microwave background, the afterglow of the Big Bang, that the hot Big Bang theory became generally accepted. Um, the radiation from the Big Bang today is cold. That's why it was discovered with these huge radio telescopes. Um, and that's, of course, because the expansion has lowered the temperature of the universe during 13 billion years of expansion. Today, we have this amazing image of the afterglow of the Big Bang. This is a sky map, not of the stars or the galaxies. It's a sky map of the universe as if behind the furthest galaxies. This is sort of a baby picture of the universe, um, 300,000 years after the Big Bang, when it became transparent, and that's the afterglow, the hot the afterglow of the um, radiation. And you see the Big Bang? This is the temperature of that radiation. You see the Big Bang was not equally hot in all places. There are these, it flickers. These flickerings are crucially important because the blue regions here are just a fraction of a fraction of a degree hotter than the red regions. And therefore, when you run the evolution of the universe forward, matter in those regions gradually begins to clump 
And that's where the stars and eventually the galaxies are born. So the, slowly you form larger structures, like clusters of galaxies, new generations of uh, stars, planets like the Earth, and at least one planet where we have life. So here you have it, 13 billion years of evolution in one minute. Um, but none of that would have happened if all the way at, in the beginning, the conditions wouldn't have been right. So that's once again this uh, question of why did the Big Bang get it right? In fact, 90 years later today, it, that question has only become more pressing because we've kept on discovering new and new properties which just seem perfect. And so sometimes I say that the Big Bang is both a cornerstone and the Achilles heel of modern cosmology. It's the cornerstone because it's a model that explains beautifully a wide range of observations. It's the Achilles heel because 90 years after its discovery, it is still not clear the deeper, the deeper why question, why the early universe got it right. And there seem to be only two reasonable options. That's the strange thing. On the one hand, you can think of it, well, maybe there's a better equation. Maybe there's an equation that replaces Einstein equation, an ultimate mathematical kernel that describes the creation of a universe that is then uniquely fit for life. That is the, in fact, to his enormous credit, uh, Stephen Hawking, in, and that's, 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 that was the main, um, the main topic also, or one of the main topics in A Brief History of Time, he was the first one to write down a mathematical model that does something like creating a universe of space and time. Sadly, the model he wrote down in A Brief History of Time, out of that model came an empty universe. So it didn't quite work. Um, but still, having, having written that down was, was, I think, a monumental step. The alternative would seem to be, um, well, maybe Le Maitre was wrong. Maybe uh, the Big Bang isn't really the beginning. Perhaps the Big Bang that we, uh, out of which we emerge is just one out of many Big Bangs. Perhaps there is a bigger space with many universes like bubbles in, in, in an expanding um, space. And each of these universes, maybe it could have its own history, even its own laws of physics. Maybe the laws of physics are just like a local phenomenon, just like the weather in Britain. And, um, even though most of these universes could then be lifeless, once in a while you're going to find, you're going to hit the jackpot and you're going to find a good one. So you all know the famous uh, Carl Sagan quote, eh, we are just, of course, eh, we are just chemical scum on a medium-sized planet orbiting an average star in an ordinary galaxy. If we live in a multiverse, sadly, we have to add another line in one of many uh, universes. And this was pretty much the situation at the time, late 90s, of my first encounter here on Silver Street with Hawking. There was this one theory that didn't work, and then there was the multiverse theory that also didn't work. Because, and I think Hawking was one of the first to really realize this, the degree of paradoxes that you get into once you begin to contemplate many, many, many universes. And it's not just that um, you can't, of course, and we can't check out another universe. Um, no, the problem with the multiverse theory is worse. The deeper problem with the multiverse is that it doesn't really quite say what we should observe, in which universe we should be. It is a complete disconnect between a cosmology or a cosmological theory and um, our, our, our viewpoint, our, our, obs our observations. So the, the theory 
leads to ambiguous predictions and therefore is not testable, not falsifiable. It's, on, it's a sort of a breakdown of standard uh, science, scientific uh, methods. And so that crisis really, that crisis in cosmology is, is really what sparked our collaboration. Um, we were, I uh, am happy to admit, we were uh, in the dark for quite a few years, but then at some point we had some sort of eureka moment, and I want to share this with you, uh, and this is how uh, Stephen uh, put it. In hindsight, well, everything is easy in, in hindsight, why it took us so long is because the problem lay um, almost at the epistemic level. You see, physics and cosmology for decades, or I would even say for centuries, have developed a wonderful method to look at the world or their, or, or their lab system or whatever as if we are outside. In fact, it's a discovery that sort of the discovery of being able to look at the world objectively is a discovery where you, the seeds of which you already see in, in going back to Copernicus. And so this is the famous drawing of Copernicus where he puts the sun in the middle. He looks at the solar system as if he's hoovering above it. That viewpoint that objective viewpoint has since Copernicus been anchored deeper and deeper in the framework of how we conceive of the laws of nature. And it's wonderful, it's, I think it's the, it's, it's the basis for much of the success story of science. It has given great, great insights. But there's this one question. If we're asking about our place in the universe, it's a mistake to put ourselves outside. In fact, it's a, the, the question that was on Stephen's mind was really is a question about how do we fundamentally relate to the nature of the universe around us. Trying to do this from the outside is the wrong approach, we realized. And so that's um, when we started thinking, what if we gave up on this Archimedean viewpoint of the cosmos? What if we try to rethink cosmology, try to reconstruct cosmology as if from the inside out, as from this new perspective? And in fact, there was a clear hint. There was a very clear inspiration came from another branch of physics, uh, which you all have heard about, I'm sure, from the uh, quantum theory, from the theory of the micro world. Quantum theory does not take this Archimedean perspective. And here you see two of the founding fathers of quantum theory, Niels Bohr and Albert Einstein, um, at the Solveig conference in Brussels. Einstein seems to be in a better mood here. Um, and so they were debating precisely this issue. In fact, the fact that quantum theory includes the observation, the act of observation within its theoretical framework was precisely what Einstein didn't like about it. And so he complained to Bohr, uh, this is not the way to do it. Physics should be an attempt to grasp reality as it is, independently of its being observed. To which Bohr replied, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. So Bohr, if you wish, um, is the René Magritte of physics. Eh? René Magritte is a surrealist painter. Um, he's an older Belgian. It's amazing what this small country produces, right? Um, and so we see here René Magritte painting himself 
painting a bird while looking at an egg. This is almost as crazy as, as quantum theory, right? The statement that Magritte wants to make here is that um, he's painting the possibility, the potential. He's making the statement that the act of observing means engaging with reality and that in doing so, you realize reality. Well, quantum theory works in much the same way. The theory describes the micro world of particles and atoms in some sort of pre-existence stage, eh? in some sort of wave function. Um, and in quantum theory, a particle, for instance, an electron, doesn't, have, doesn't quite have a position until you ask what is its, what is its position. Eh? Same with Schr the famous Schrodinger's cat. The cat isn't quite dead or alive until you look at it, until you ask whether it's alive or dead. Well, all, we, all Stephen and I did was we ran with it. We took quantum theory and we ran with it and we applied it to these earliest stages of the evolution of our universe. In fact, there's a famous uh, cosmic variant of Magritte, if you wish, um, first drawn by, by John Wheeler. Um, here it is, the U stands for the universe, of course. And the Big Bang is up there, and the universe evolves, and it grows, and then you have that I to indicate that a tangible history only emerges in a quantum universe from the fundamental acts of observation. It doesn't need to be a human observer, of course. It could be just like a single photon that's enough to perform a quantum act of observation. In fact, for um, while we're here in the UK, it's a bit like Tom Riddle's diary in the Harry Potter books, right? Eh, the diary is, is empty, but it has the answers to all sorts of questions. If you ask, well, quantum theory works the same way. Um, it, a tangible reality arises from a horizon of possibilities through a continual process of interaction and observer. So, what happens then if we go back to the earliest stages of our universe and we try to unlock the chamber of secrets of the Big Bang? We go back in time from within our observational situation, we trace our history backwards. Well, how, do, how does it look like there in these earliest stages? In fact, what you, you bump in these earliest stages on a kind of simplification process at the level of physics. And we have all these different laws today. We have all these different forces, all these different species of particles. The electromagnetic force, the nuclear forces, the dark forces governing the dark matter, that's probably another zoo which we still have to explore, and gravity. If you go back to exceedingly early times, they simplify, they merge, they unify. And we've always thought that there would be a kernel, like a final, like a bottom layer, like a final truth from which this tree of laws emerges. But the hypothesis that Stephen and I developed is different. We view this more as an evolutionary process, as a co-evolution of the laws of physics with the universe that is taking shape, which if we drive this backwards, continues all the way, till the last feature of diversification also disappears, namely the difference between space and time. So in our hypothesis, when we go back to the earliest stages, it is evolution that wins. Evolution at the level of the laws of physics. The dimension of time sort of evaporates. Stephen would say time becomes imaginary. That was his famous, uh, his famous um, statement, right? Time becomes imaginary, so any notion of causality or real time uh, disappears, right? Even Brexit happened in real time. Um, and it really means that time becomes a space dimension. So you get combi it gets combined with other space dimensions. And what can you do if you only have space? You can close off the past uh, a little bit like is evoked here, uh, like, like a sphere. 
In fact, I sometimes wonder whether uh, Stephen was inspired by Wagner on this, eh, because when Parsifal uh, says that I hardly move, yet far I seem to have come, he gets a reply. You see, son, here time becomes space. And Wagner came before uh, Stephen. Eh? Um, okay, so but this branching process, that tree of laws that I've sketched, of course, makes us think of something. It makes us think of Darwin. It is as if in the most primitive environment of the earliest stages of the universe, there is, at the quantum level, a kind of Darwinian process taking place with variation driven by quantum randomness and selection driven by the primitive interactions, the quantum acts of observation between the fields that are there. And just like the tree of life, this process, how we envision it, could have turned out completely uh, differently. So, we have these two amazing sketches. Right? No. Left for you guys. This way. Um, you have the first sketch by Darwin of the Tree of Life. Just after he returned from the Galapagos Islands. That way, we have the sketch by Georges Lemaitre, exactly one century later, of this one biophilic universe that he found. A universe which has this slow phase of expansion before it accelerates. For 90 years, we haven't tried to understand these two sketches on a different ontological basis. With Darwin, it is quite clear that chance and evolution win. With cosmology, we've always thought there was a, this was an evolution against a stable, immutable background of absolutes, a kind of mathematical structure. The crux of the hypothesis that Stephen and I have put forward is that this is a mistake, that in fact we should think of both graphs as evolutionary, fundamentally evolutionary, and as different layers, wildly different layers of one evolutionary process. The biggest consequence is that just like if we trace life back to the origin, we all know that the laws of biology, the laws of Mendel and so forth, disappear. The consequence here, of course, in physics, is also that if we trace the evolution of the universe back to its origin, that it is not just the origin of time, but the origin of laws itself. And so that is the crux of um, my book, On the Origin of Time, is of course a variation of On the Origin of Species. It's an interesting, it's been a very interesting journey, of course, with Hawking, because as we all know, the earlier Hawking had a philosophical position much like that of Einstein. That's the position he conveyed very clearly in A Brief History of Time, uh, where, in fact, he said we, we pretty much have the final theory. The later Hawking, in my view, ended up with a position um, much closer to how I imagine the position uh, of Lemaitre. In other words, a position where there is not really a foundation, but where, in the end, evolution uh, wins. Um, now, I should stress that this change did not come about from saying, uh, imagine Stephen saying, yeah, I'm going to change philosophical position. This is not how, how he worked, right? No, it came about from trying to resolve the paradoxes that the multiverse comes with and just try to figure out a better, a more powerful, a cleaner, a more coherent cosmological theory. In fact, it's very clear from the mission of the Center for Theoretical Cosmology here in Cambridge, um, this is, this is how, how Hawking sort of laid it out, right? We want to develop theories of the universe that are mathematically consistent and observationally testable. And with regard to that mathematical consistency, in fact, Hawking, being unable to manipulate equations, liked to think in terms of pictures. He liked to think in terms of projections of the earlier universe onto, uh, say, a disk like here. Uh, this is Escher's projection of a curved dimensional space 
on a disk. And similarly, the essence of the hypothesis for the Big Bang that we developed can be thought of as a projection. The Big Bang in this projection is in the middle, and the universe today is at the edge. So in contrast to Escher's projection, where the radial direction of the disk was a dimension of space, in our model of the Big Bang, the radial dimension projected here is, a, is the dimension of time. And the real quantum nature, and that's been the, what, this makes, what this makes exciting really, is that a truly quantum outlook on this projection suggests that the interior of this disk is in fact a hologram. So holography, the idea of holographic physics has been the talk of the town in theoretical physics for 20 years, and this is how we believe it applies to the earliest stages of our universe. You know a familiar hologram in which an extra space dimension emerges from a screen. In the way holographic physics uh, is developed now, it is the early time evolution that is in fact holographically encoded in a hologram, a quantum system that resides uh, on the boundary that resides, that gives a sort of a timeless representation of um, our universe today. And so what would be the disappearance of the laws in the, at the Big Bang? It would be really like almost as if you're running out of bits, if you're running out of information all the way uh, back into the Big Bang. So it's a little bit like uh, a, good, a good section of a sequoia. You can read the history backwards in time, starting from the edge towards the middle. And of course, at some point, your tree is no longer there. Now, with regard to observations, that's a whole different talk, that's a whole different chapter. The Big Bang is in, is in the... The Big Bang is not so... It's not visible, right? We bump into that radiation, we bump into the afterglow of the Big Bang, and we can't look further because the earliest stages of the universe are opaque. The only way that we can truly unlock these earliest stages of evolution that I've talked about is probably by further developing gravitational wave observatories. Gravitational waves are ripples of space-time. Those ripples of space-time cause uh, minute, differen minute differences in length, which you can hope to observe with such huge satellites like LISA here, or with future observatories on Earth like the Einstein telescope. Right now, we have already observed gravitational waves, but those are gravitational waves that are generated much later. They're generated from in the collision of black holes. The gravitational waves that we are hunting for uh, in cosmology are really gravitational waves associated with this primeval evolution where the laws of physics themselves fragmented and perhaps even gravitational waves from the earliest stages of inflation where, who knows, the holographic nature of time may become manifest. So that is the future. Clearly, what we're proposing is a hypothesis that builds on the one hand on a lot of work and that opens up um, a lot of opportunities for the future. So that's in, uh, very briefly, in uh, exactly 38 minutes, right? Um, my journey with, with, with Hawking. Um, as you know, his ashes are uh, buried in Westminster in between the graves of Newton and Darwin, which, uh, as I hope I have explained, is extremely appropriate. So these are some of his final words to me. Um, and they touch on this change of perspective this change of perspective away from the earlier Hawking who believed in an ultimate theory. And so he says there, I used to belong to that camp. But then he continues and he says, I'm now glad that our search for understanding will never come to an end and that we will always have the challenge of new discovery. Without it, 
we would stagnate. So this was typically Hawking, right? He changed his mind purely for scientific reasons, and then there was this human touch never far away. And in fact, his words here resonate very much with the words of, br of a brilliant German philosopher, Hannah Arendt, in the 60s, who pointed to the importance of a certain finitude in science and technology. Yeah? So in the human condition, her book, she writes that somehow science and technology must eventually uncode a certain finiteness inherent in our human condition if they are going to truly save us, if they are going to truly, in her words, move humanity uh, forward towards a better uh, future. And Hannah Arendt searched for that kernel of finiteness in the science and technology of her age, and in fact, back to the scientific revolution, and she felt she didn't find it. And I dare say that the new framework that Stephen and I uh, put forward is in fact a response, um, and so with the profoundly evolutionary understanding of even the laws of physics, in which the Big Bang is not just the origin of time, but the origin of laws, it's a response to Arendt's concerns. And so in my uh, book, I don't know where it is, but my book um, concludes with a virtual encounter between Hannah and Stephen. Thank you. Yes, yes, I think um, there's a mic there. Uh, thank you for the lovely lecture. Uh, you asked some intriguing questions at the very beginning, and I wondered what your theory is about the cause of the universe. Why did it uh, happen, yeah. and what was there before the Big Bang? Just your personal, casual observations would be welcome. <laughs> okay, casually we can do that. Uh, um, yeah, so I spoke about various options. Maybe there is, uh, it's just randomness like in the multiverse. Maybe there is a unique cause dictated by a final theory. And the, Dar the more Darwinian-like picture that I propose is in a way something in between because it says that the design, that the laws could have turned out completely different, that they're the result of an early phase of evolution, and certainly in that holographic understanding it's clear that if you go back all the way, that the laws themselves disappear, and therefore also your question disappears. <laughs> you asked for a casual answer. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. Thank you very much for an amazing lecture. And Thank you. I did read your article in The New Scientist as well. Um, I've been working on a play. I'm a lawyer and a poet. My name is Robert Rippol. Or based on the anthropic principle, and I'm not sure you're helping me. <laughs> so what I'm going to do is just simply read uh, the question you pose in page 161 of your book, just even if, if only to help the sales. Um, but what selects the anthropic principle, the anthropic properties that specify the ensemble of observers, a keyword, of which we supposedly typical randomly selected members? What are the characteristics that make us perfect for our universe, which is essentially my play. The universe is perfect because it's perfect for us. So why, why do you dismiss the anthropic principle, essentially? Because the anthropic principle, so the anthropic principle is invoked um, to essentially select our universe in the multiverse. And it does so by first specifying 
you or I or anyone else get to specify what we mean by an anthropic thing. It could be life, it could be a galaxy, it could be some particle force, it could be whatever. And then you can get going, then you can begin to select your universe. The problem is that, uh, and that is the notion of typicality, you will then select that universe which has, the, which has your anthropic principle as the typical outcome. The problem is that this is an entirely subjective um, way of doing, it's not science, it's a way of selecting. That, uh, and by that I mean that someone else could select a different anthropic principle, uh, a property, and is going to land in a different universe. And then the two of you are going to debate here, and there will be no <coughs> rational outcome whatsoever possible. And that is because the anthropic principle is an attempt to get us post facto in the equations. And so it's disconnected from the mathematical framework of the theory. You could make an analogy. Did Darwin need a zillion other planets to, do, to figure out or to study biological evolution on this planet? He did not. And the reason is that he did not assume that, we are the tip, that our tree of life is the typical outcome of um, all possible trees of life. But this I explain further down in my... In my <laughs> <laughs> if we chose, like, for instance, the uh, speed of light as the criteria, that creates our universe, doesn't it? No, that would not be uh, fairly anthropic. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, I'm happy to come to your play. Oh, yeah, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, no, no. Yeah. Hi. Hi. You said right Hi. at the oh. beginning of your lecture that um, Stephen Hawking said that it looks like the universe has been designed. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that's very fascinating. I mean... <laughs> I'd like to know your mm. thoughts on uh, f the simulation theory, you know, the, the fact that we're actually living in a simulation, that we are part of the universe and, we're, you know, the future's already happened and we're watching it all unfold and, uh, and we'll get to that point when we actually realise we're actually yeah. part of some massive computer programme or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Right. That's another wild question. Um, <laughs> Right, so by design, he, he then, back then, and, 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 and all of us, we were using that word, he just meant it looks like it's just so fit for life as we know it. Huh? Mm. Uh, and I used to be firmly against this whole simulation kind of thing. Um, but then we had started to develop this, this holographic, uh, this hologram of the earliest stages of our universe. And so let me in two minutes explain how this hologram works. How does the interior evolution of the universe emerges from that hologram on the boundary? In fact, the holograms that are entering in our research are very much like the quantum systems of entangled particles that quantum engineers uh, are trying to construct to build quantum computers. You see where I'm going, right? And the way the interior emerges from the hologram on the boundary is by looking at the entanglement on the boundary on larger and larger scales. You kind of zoom out. Um, and that's how reality as we experience it, with three space and a time dimension, emerges. And of course, it's very puzzling, uh, even to theoretical physicists. Um, because there is no intrinsic notion of time in this hologram, so the only thing we can kind of imagine that sort of comes close is a little bit like as if this hologram acts like a quantum code, and there you are. That's a good play as well for your... Uh... <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for the fascinating talk. I look forward to reading the book. So, uh, so in light of what you talked about, uh, since you mentioned Darwinian processes, and you also talked about the shift in C Stephen Hawking's own thoughts in terms of engagement with uh, Newton to uh, engagement with Darwin, I was wondering this new theory of time in universe or multiverse, uh, from an evolutionary perspective, so do the evolutionary processes, are they said to be in a spirit of uh, competition? or individual struggle, as Darwin would suggest, or in a spirit of collaboration, solidarity, uh, you know, more collective struggle, as, say, Kropotkin and others would uh, yeah. mention. And why would you take the position that you would be taking in this new theory of time? Yeah, okay. 
I, I, I don't intend to, uh, to draw that analogy uh, between physics and biology literally, um, but roughly speaking, because we have a different language down at the quantum level in physics where I claim this evolution plays out. And the language we have are these quantum observations, and on the other hand, so that you could f loosely think of as, as the primitive environment of fields and particles that are present in these earlier stages, doing, acting as a selection, uh, doing observations, eh, so essentially interacting with one another, and thereby selecting a branch of history. Whether that's competition or collaboration, I, we, have no, we have not even a word for that in, in quantum physics. I think it's a combination of both, really. Um, yeah. Yes, thanks very much for an absolutely fascinating, stimulating talk. Um, you mentioned dark matter and dark energy at the beginning, and then you brought in these interesting ideas of selection uh, around the, the laws of physics. Do you think there's any possibility that dark matter and dark energy are actually some alternative form of selection that exists in our current universe? And because they're so different, uh, we're not able to observe them because our methods of observation are in our laws of physics, and they, this dark energy and dark matter is in some completely different Sector. form of the laws of physics. Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, right, so that's, that's a very valid question, of course. 95% of the matter and the energy in the universe at present time is dark. Um, so we only know about that indirectly. In fact, it's another reason why I'm kind of a fan of these gravitational wave ob observations, because gravitational waves are sensitive directly to the dark sector of our universe, and we can hope they, they teach us something about that, they unlock. With regard to your question, I don't know, but what this hypothesis in general terms would suggest is that when we do succeed at unlocking the dark matter sector, we're going to find more evidence for accidental, seemingly accidental, seemingly designed properties, in contrast to what uh, a standard uh, reduction physicist approach would tell you, uh, you would be looking for like the answer, the coherent answer that tells you how it must be. Um, so, in, in a sense, I think that the observations of dark energy and some other observations that really have sort of triggered the idea that, wait, these laws of physics, they're seemingly accidentally designed, I think it's only going to increase um, those features, yeah. We probably have time for one more question. So, I have a question here. Um, my question is, uh, and, and actually it's a question in two parts, the first of which is very small. I just want to verify that I understood correctly what you were saying in the context of holography, that the quantum theory that you get on the boundary has no notion of time. Um, or did I mishear that? No, no, you heard this correctly. So I heard this correctly. Then the question that I want to ask is, in what sense is that is a theory with no notion of time an actual physical theory? Like, is that just a theory on like how you can observe different things that never evolve? Like, wh what does that even mean? Any, ma any physical theory is at its heart nothing else than an abstract representation of our reality. And if we can get it that abstract that even the notion of evolution emerges, it's, it's no different. It's, it's just a, a level more abstract than what we're used to. You see, ultimately, in retrospect, again, in hindsight, the Big Bang is the origin of time. How can you begin to model this in physics? Well, the only way out, really, is that ultimately time, in your physical theory, in your model, must somehow also be an emergent property, because it's an, if it's an emergent property, you can it can disappear and appear in a controlled manner. And so, in, in hindsight, it's something like this we were looking for all along. 
but you're absolutely right that this, and this is the crux of our theory, is not a physical law as the ones we've known for many, many centuries, because it is not simply a law of evolution. It's a mixture between conditions, boundary conditions, and evolution. That's the, that's the, the point. Thank you for the thoughts. Any last questions? OK, we have time for one more. I just wonder about God. <laughs> I admire your <laughs> dexterity of mind, but actually, he'd planned it all. Right, but this is beyond my book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm struggling here. I'm, I'm a layman. But I found your introduction of um, the effect of observation really fascinating. But about halfway through, through you, you, you said that the observation could be a human observation, or I think you said a photon. Yeah. I need a bit of help with that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. When these folks like Niels Bohr and Einstein discovered the quantum theory, they noticed that the act of observation, looking at it, measuring something, um, is not just uh, an innocent thing happening uh, as if it was not influencing the system. Any observation, any measurement, involves some sort of interaction. It could be the exchange of a light particle. It could be, as you say, a human observer. Einstein joked whether it could be a casual glance from a mouse. It could be anything. But the observations, uh, the measurement in quantum theory, the act of observation we talk, we talk about is, is something very general. It can be performed, as I said, by just a single photon. It's, it doesn't need to be, I'm sorry, it doesn't need to be a human observer. I'm happier. <laughs> Good. Thank you, Thomas, and thank You're you for welcome. everyone for joining us tonight. Could I just remind you that if you're interested in getting a book and getting it signed, please exit through this door. If not, please exit through the other door. Thank you.